Hello and welcome to our third Wednesday Consumer Car Chat uh, with U.S. Auto Training. We'll have Pam Oaks and Peter Sudak on here in a minute. Um, obviously, I'm, we're coming to you live from home today. And uh, we're really excited about this evening's chat. Um, we often do a uh, different things about different cars and different things to be aware of and to listen for. But tonight we're going to uh, talk about how to be a good customer um, because ultimately... You need to be a good customer to get your car problem solved. So uh, it's going to help. <laughs> yep. And communications is key and how you communicate is important. And um, I know uh, that uh, Pam and Peter have a lot to share on that experience from a lot of, uh, of uh, shop, <laughs> shop experience. So you guys want to introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Pam Oaks. I'm Master ASC Automotive, uh, medium heavy duty truck tech and trainer nationwide. Actually, in Canada, so international. Peter. Hi, I'm Peter. I'm Peter Sudak. I'm also ASC certified technician and certified rubberologist for tires. Yes, he is. I'm the tire. I'm the tire guru. He is the he is the tire guru. Yes, he is. Thank you, Terry. Thank you for having us on again. Thank you, Terry. Well, I'm glad you're here. Um, Dave, David missing. wasn't able to join us this evening, but apparently he's going to be hiding in the wings somewhere and throwing some hardball questions at you along the line. So um, we, hope that others, yes. <laughs> we hope that others who are, who are watching will also share their questions uh, in the chat. Uh, this is going to be a slide being live streamed on Facebook and YouTube, and you can go back and check out the information later on. Um, but uh, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Well, well, like David, I've known Peter for a long time too. So we got yeah. a, lot of, a lot of war stories. Don't we, Peter? Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> a lot of war stories. And, you know, tonight we really want to talk about how to be a good customer. And you're like, now what is she telling us this for, right? But seriously, telling the technician, telling the shop advisor everything that's going on is just going to save you money in the long run. Right, Peter? Absolutely. <laughs> Hiding information or telling us after the fact is going to end up costing you a lot more money than if you just, it's not a national secret. Just tell us what's going on. Cars <laughs> just, don't lie. Cars don't lie. <laughs> so if you've been speeding 100 miles an hour and you tell us you've only been doing 60 and the engine blew up, we'll find out and know. Oh, remember that one? Oh, yeah. We, yeah, we. you know what I'm talking about. That's 10 Guy boys. Driving, yeah. Driving a fleet vehicle and... We did just the basic uh, change of plugs, wires, etc. And he came back in driving a fleet vehicle, meaning he did not own this vehicle, came back in and said, oh, my car is running like garbage. It's not what he said, but editing this because it is family time. <laughs> and he says, <laughs> what did you do to my car? What did you do to it? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, ah, da, 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 And I says, okay. And so we went in there, and guess what? We found out he was going 104 miles an hour down the interstate. In a Chevy S10 Blazer, no less. In a four-banger, four-cylinder S10 Blazer with a bunch of AC, home AC equipment in the back of the truck. I mean, it was loaded. That truck, that check engine light came on because it was saying, help stop <laughs> stop doing this boss so that's not being a good customer right no nah, it's all a little bit of a fib it told us a fib cars don't lie so what you need to do is you know hey if you did something we understand we're all human but if you did something please just tell us just tell us, be right out front and tell us, you know, we had a God, we have hundreds of these not thousands through the decades of these stories of people uh, trying to hide the fact and being a good customer, not only is just telling us what's going on, uh, you know, coming into the shop, we've seen it day in, day out through the years. It's really hard when your car breaks down. And you're, you're upset, you're disappointed, you don't want to spend money on your vehicle. 
And yet there you are standing in front of us. Sometimes the car's on a hook. It's on a tow truck. And you'll, I mean, it, that just doubles the aggravation, the anxiety. But uh, remember that person across the counter? It's an individual too. So sometimes you just kind of have to tone it down because they didn't cause this. You didn't cause it. It's just wear and tear in the vehicle. And they're not made to last forever. We had a, one of my uh, students that we're training right now, for an example, he has an 84 Chevy C10 Silverado. And all of a sudden the back end, the rear end, the differential just came apart. He heard a noise and a couple of miles later, it came apart in pieces. And he was upset. He was like, I can't believe this is happening. And I says, you know, you got to think about this for a second. That back end was, it hadn't been touched except for differential fluid changes. I said, in 37 years, I said, it's allowed to break. Right, yeah. Peter? Yeah, that's, you got to give it a little bit of leeway time there. So you, you got to... You got to understand that the person behind the counter is there to actually help you get you through this and not to bark at them too much if you can help it. You've had some stories, haven't you, Peter? Yeah, we've had a few where they come in yelling and screaming and just after just basically they just want to come in and vent. And at, at least in my spot, you just sit there and listen to them. And then you just explain your procedure, what you're going to do. And then they kind of understand, they get settled. And then everything is usually pretty kosher after that, you know, because they're probably thinking, great, car is going to be here for days. I have no way home, you know, and you get all those issues settled for them and everything's fine. And everybody you goes on their merry way. Exactly. But you need to be a good customer. Uh, another thing being a good customer is that, you know, when they're asking you these questions, just be honest with them. If you don't know, say, I don't know. But if you do know, give, give them a little bit of a heads up. Because like I said, it's going to save you in diagnostic time. It really, really, truly will. Right. Um, right. Something that may be brewing ahead of time, you keep on hearing the noise and the noise gets louder and louder and louder. Yeah, I got to take it in. I got to get it fixed. I know I got to get it fixed. Trust me, we do it as technicians too. And it's our own car. I was like, yeah, when I get time and I'm not working on somebody else's car, uh, I'm going to take care of this. And unfortunately, sometimes we we don't, do we, Peter? No, but unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately the uh, working on your own car is one of the last things you want to do. I've, we've talked to a lot of techs at our own shop over the years, like, God, I've been working on these cars and it's good. great. Now I got to do this to my car. That's just what I want to do on a Saturday. And like Saturday you know. afternoon, right? Yeah. But yeah, we have to, but see, we're, we're listening and in the back of our head, you know, we're actually plotting our plan of attack to repair whatever noise or whatever symptom we're feeling. But as customers, it would really help a lot if you had maybe a little stick em note or something at the end of your drive or, you know, when you go into a parking spot and just before you turn the key off, write it down, you know, gee, the, the car was hesitating every time I hit the gas pedal at a green light, you know, give us little clues like that. That's always best. Again, it's going to make your diagnostic time a lot shorter. Right. And, and just regarding the check engine light, I know a lot of people like to go to parts stores and get it done for free. And they go, okay, well, this is what the car needs. That's what the parts store says. I'm like, A, wrong. So I worked at parts stores where they did that. And I would always tell customers, well, this is the most likely cause. However, go take it to a shop and go get it properly diagnosed. No, I don't know if I told you this one, Peter, but... On one of my many training adventures somewhere here in the U.S., quite often I'm coupled with uh, a sales manager, a territory sales manager. And there's this one case where they had to stop into a store and the guy had the portable code reader. 
And every person that went in there needed an oxygen sensor. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work like that, guys. They're there to help you out, to get you the right part. When it comes to diagnostics, you got to let a professional do it. You know, you're getting this code read for free. And you always get what you pay for, right? And it's free. And that's about how much it's worth. It's free. You have to have a professional do it because each one of these oxygen sensors, you know, there's just several codes for them. And, you know, it could have the heater elements out of it or most likely that you'll see is that it's running lean. The vehicle's running lean. It'll throw an oxygen O2 code out for you. We had a customer that happened to uh, come over to us and he just moved to the area, didn't have a shop, went over to the parts store, check engine lights on, and they said, oh, you need an oxygen sensor. His vehicle had four and you're supposed to replace them in pairs. That's how the manufacturer wants you to do, the pre and post cat O2s. So he did that and it happened that he had a uh, foreign vehicle. So those are a little bit more money. Mm -hmm. It ran over $200 a piece. It's four of them. Okay, we got the math so far, right? He did it himself over at his apartment, laid on the ground, replaced him. Check engine light wasn't on anymore. Drove it for about a week. Check engine light came back on. Okay. Went back over to the same place. They go, oh, you need plugs and wires. <laughs> well, they sold him plugs and wires. It's almost a couple hundred bucks. So now we got almost, what, $1,000 into it? A thousand, a thousand bucks now, yeah. yeah. Light came back on again, and he was over there. He's pretty mad. And they told him, you have to go to a shop now. Should have went to the shop to begin yeah. with. But you have to go to a shop now. Went over, happened to be our shop, came in. And you know what he needed? He had a vacuum leak that was triggering the O2 code. It was a $12 part. Little elbow. $12 part, guys. And he spent how much? plus his time and his labor, can't do it. Go to the pro first. Even though you think that they're oh so expensive, they really aren't in the long run, are they? Lesson no, learned. Because you get it diagnosed properly a lot quicker and get the right parts and get it done professionally. Get somebody who knows what they're doing. Now I want to have everybody put yourself in the service advisor's shoes for a moment because this is part two of this. You're in the service advisor shoe and somebody comes in and they are manic. They're mad. Their car won't run. It's coming in on a hook, on a tow truck. They're just really upset. And you get blasted out of the blue, out of the blue. So as a service advisor, you're getting an earful in how it's all your fault, which... In reality, when this person's calmer, he's a much more reasonable person. But still, you're getting blasted right now. How are you going to help this individual who's being pretty mouthy with you? You're going to back off, right? That's right. So service advisors kind of trained to how to handle these people. But still, we're all human. You're going to back off. When you're doing that, you may not, how would you say, get all the information because in the back of your mind, you're like, boy, this guy, he's yelling at me and I don't have this coming to me because it's not my car and I didn't cause this. We're all human. We're going to be doing this. So while this is going on in the back of his head, he might not be writing down everything the person's yeah, saying. Missing, it. <laughs> missing data. So as mad as you are, Kind of, kind of think for a second. You know what I mean? Think or go over again when you take that deep breath after you've vented and then again explain. And, you know, maybe a, I'm sorry might help a little bit too sometimes because we've seen them pretty, pretty cranky. Yeah, especially, especially as a dealership. It's, yeah. it's like time shifting. <laughs> Times it by two. 
Because <laughs> I've seen I've seen the f bomb literally dropped on you oh, know yeah. a little piece of garbage the car that I'm doing warranty work on and this and that and yeah there there's no limit to what they cousins wear out there and let the service advisor has it and I just you have to sit there and take it and it's like I didn't make the car I'm here to help you but yeah I didn't really get that across when they're you know I gotta tell you this and I don't know if I did any. But I'm going to tell everybody else. So don't stop me if I told you, Peter. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I was over for warranty work. And I was uh, <laughs> I was just talking and this woman came in. And I mean, she was just screaming. She sounded like Ethel Merman in It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. Remember Ethel Merman? She played the mother-in-law. She was like, ah, ah, ah. yeah. And everybody just stopped. They just stopped. And uh, I don't think her car, I don't know if it went to the back of the line or what was going on with it. But um, you can't you can't do that. You're talking about the dealership that just triggered in my head. But you know, you gotta you gotta tell these guys everything as much as you can because they're writing it down. And if you ever did that thing he said, she said. So you would say the color is blue and then you go to the next person, you go, the color is blue and you go around the circle. And by the time it gets next to you, it could have the sky is blue, right? So it's yeah. all so important to tell them what's going on the first time. Or even write it down sometime would help significantly. Yep. Definitely. <laughs> it feels matter no matter how insignificant you may think they are. Yes. Remember that as much as we want to be the center of attention, there's a lot of other people out there that need the attention of the shops and the service advisors. So if you can write it down or if you have to have an appointment or you need to make an appointment, that may benefit you as well. Yeah, because sometimes coming in, they won't be able to take care of you and you're already mad about having to be there in the first place and then not being able to get in because you don't have an appointment, that just adds fuel to the fire. But make an appointment. That will definitely help, and that will at least lock you in time-wise to get your car looked at. Hey, guess what? Dave. Hey, Dave. We just saw over here on the comments, Dave uh, chimed in here and said, yeah, the service advisors need to be like an investigator. Boy, aren't you know for Hi, Dave. <laughs> Says, ask the questions to be able to get past an upset customer. Very true. Yes. It's Dave, he lived it as well. He was in that position in parts too, because he was dealing not only with the consumer, he was dealing with the shops as well. So I'm sure he's got a lot of horror stories that we'll be talking to him later on about. So we have another question here. It says, what are the most helpful things a shop needs to know about a problem? What and where? Yep. Just like we had in elementary school with the story, right? Yep. Well, where you know when did it happen and where did it happen? Where did it happen? So, so any details out. No, definitely not. Let's see here. Trying to read this, the glare, and I should have my glasses on. That's it. I'm giving in. Yep, I'm yes. old. There you go. Oh, yeah, that's right, Dave, and what sound it's making. And, you know, tell us the sound. We're not going to laugh at you. We aren't. We understand because we make sounds, too, when we go back and we talk to the tech. Or if we're the tech, we'll listen to you, and we'll make the sound back to make sure that we understand what it is. You know, it's interesting with the sounds because um, we actually have tools now that can uh, help us discover where the sounds are at. They're called electronic ears. They've been around for decades. Love electronic ears. As a matter of fact, the uh, manufacturers are starting to incorporate the electric ear concept into their vehicles going forward into autonomous vehicles. So basically, if the vehicle hears a noise that it's unfamiliar to the operation of that vehicle, 
it will set a code. And with that code set, it will drive itself to the dealership for the repair. That's how it's working. <laughs> now the technician in the shop has to kind of decipher what sound it's hearing. I mean, it's going to have a code, but uh, Honda's doing this. They announced it uh, about a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, a couple of other manufacturers, they're doing this. And the reason why they're putting electronic ears in the car to listen to these sounds is because an autonomous vehicle is going to be really, 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 really expensive, guys. Uh, you're not going to have two or three sitting out in the driveway or in the garage. Uh, autonomous vehicles, they uh, predict that, you know, maybe one car per family possibly vehicle is going to be driving by itself. They have a command right now, even in Germany, they have this program going on in Stuttgart where uh, I would take my phone app. I would call for the vehicle. The vehicle would come to me. I would put the address into where I wanted to go. I get in the vehicle. It takes me to my destination and then it picks up its next appointment. So you and I driving in our own vehicles, we're used to the sounds that it makes. And if we hear an unusual sound, we're supposed to take it over to <laughs> the repair shop. Oh, yeah. yeah. And go in and have a, a conniption fit because we broke down. But you're not going to have that driver in there all the time. You're going to have different people in this vehicle. It's kind of like the lift concept, okay? Different people getting in the vehicle. Well, if you're picking up a bizarre noise that wasn't there before, the next person getting in that vehicle may have never, ever been in that car before, thinks, yeah, that's a normal noise, and goes to the destination and goes off and does whatever they want to do. But... If the noise gets worse, they don't want the vehicle breaking down with a passenger in it. So therefore, it's recognizing noises, driving itself to the dealership or the repair shop, get the repair. Right that's now, good. doing it right now. Yeah, it's a good theory. We're good in a level, level two, a heavy level two right now. There's five levels of autonomous. We're in a heavy level two. Not quite going over to level three yet. That's another topic for another time, which is a lot of fun in itself. We got to do that soon. Get Dave in on us, right, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but that's the way things are going, you know? And as technicians, now we have the consumer, and now we're going to have the car talking to us. And the car is not going to be telling us. It's going to be telling us a lot more than the consumer because we're going to be able to communicate with that code to pinpoint which microphone that's lighting up with the loudest noise. It's going to give us an area. And that's what we're asking the consumer. Can give us an area. You know, my car is not running right. Well, how's it not running right? Yeah, just got to dig in. Like Dave said, you got to be mm -hmm. like an investigator. Yep, that's perfect. Perfect. What Dave said. Here's another question. What's the most common issue people go to the shop for? Well, if I had to take a guess, uh, flat tires, <laughs> nails, and, nails and tires. <laughs> nails and tires. That's that's because, A, you're in Florida. <laughs> a lot yeah. of construction. <laughs> and, B, because you're always in the tire department, right? Yeah. And when I, when I worked at my last job, there's a lot of people who came in for tire repairs. Tire Flat repairs? Oh, yeah. And real quick, why don't you tell them about flat repair, what they need to do before I go on and finish answering this. Well, basically, A, don't ever put a plug in your tire unless it's temporary so you can get to a shop. Try to avoid fix a flat if you can, but like I said, that's temporary as well. But if you can make it to the shop, have them put a patch on the inside. That's the best patch. It's basically one and done. You won't have to touch it again. Call a patch plug. Yeah, call a patch plug, yeah. But you can't and do it on all tires, can you? 
No, you can't do run flats and you can't do them on the edge of the tire either. There's this in between the tread grooves is the area that's allowed to be patched. If it's on either side of that towards the edge, the tire's got to be replaced. There are some shops that will stuff a plug in there to get you by because nobody wants to do that. But um, you have to patch it properly or replace the tire. Just do it right because so, you could have a serious problem if that patch, if that plaques that plug goes out. Yeah. And then of course on speed rated tires. Yeah. Replace them. Yeah. Oh, you know, Dave brought up a good point. Fix the flat, tell the tech. How many times have you got spat, splashed by fix a flat, Peter? Yeah, I've gotten, in my, I've gotten it in my face a couple times. Or I tried to balance somebody's tire because they had a vibration and the wheel, the weights keep changing on me. So I go and talk to the customer and said, is there something inside this tire? Oh, yeah, I forgot. There's fix-a-flat in there. I was like, okay, that explains oh, yeah. I can't balance it because the water and the liquid is constantly shifting. So it's putting the heavy spot in a different area every time. And that stuff burns, too, when it gets on attack. Uh, yeah, it burns, and it's not good for your eyes either. It's just it'll really, really burn your eyes real good. Yeah, it will. So please tell us if you put fix-a-flat in, in the tire. And Dave, Dave mentioned, uh, he said brakes, and that's what I was going to say, brakes. Yeah, I think that would, that would be a close, very, very close second. Yeah. But just in my experience, a lot of lot of flat repairs, but yep. a lot of people don't realize brakes need to be looked at until they hear these strange noises, and it's like way too late after that. That's when it costs you the most money instead of doing a regular brake inspection every oil change. Yeah. And, you know, it's maybe a little chirp, and then it gets to a little squeal, and then a little louder squeal, and then it's a grinding noise. And we've seen them to the point that it's gone through the rotor, and then it yeah. gets really pricey because then you're doing calipers, hoses, rotors, pads, yeah. versus yeah. just replacing brake pads. Did you know there's two different types of brake pads? Yeah, the yes. is organic, the semi-metallic, and there's ceramic. No, that's not what I was talking about. There's the cheap, 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 and then there's the DOT, Department of Transportation Approved Pad, which will have a DOT number on the box. Okay. Don't go cheap. Get the good stuff. Yep. I agree with that. And doing parts over the years as people... Some people get the top of the line stuff that the shops use, the good stuff, the one and done. Some want to go cheap because they not do anything with the rotors. They just want to get the brakes go by them and, you know, it just all depends. Try and talk them into the good stuff, but sometimes they just want to go as cheap as possible because the car's 15 years old, you know, what have you. It's That's, too bad. Yeah. Can't do that. Too bad. Nope. I do agree. It, do it the right way or you don't do it at all. Especially when it comes to tires and brakes, you know, Always have that conversation is what's most important, tires or brakes? And you and I have gone back and forth, and too bad Dave is not here for this because he'd have a good laugh too. It's like, you know, it was split personalities here. I still say brakes. You can't stop, you're in big time trouble, right? That's right. That's right. You know. The tires, the tires help with stopping, but the brakes do 99% of it. Tires help, but the tires help. They keep while it. you're driving down the road, the tires are the only yes, thing too. between you and the and and the highway. So between you and the ground. So it's it's but yeah, I'd, I'd probably agree. Brakes would probably be most important for you to be able to stop. You're just saying that, aren't you? Sure, why not? You're just saying that because I'm making dinner, right? No, actually, I'm making dinner, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Oh, all right. Yeah, okay. We'll see. But, yeah, brakes, extremely important, yeah. Good point, Dave, to bring up the brakes as well. The other thing that they uh, – <laughs> that people have a tendency to come in for is uh, safety inspections. How much air is in my tires? Can you check the air in my tires? Can yeah. you check the fluid level? Got a lot of that. 
Yeah, got a lot of that. Oil changes. A lot of oil changes, right? Yeah, a lot of those. That's where you do all your inspections. All your inspections. Should be doing them during the safety inspection, too, when you're just topping the fluids off. Yeah, take a look at the tires while you can, yeah. I don't know if everybody – I'm sorry. No, I was going to say a lot of people, they're just getting their fluids checked, then all of a sudden they see their car going up on the rack. They're probably wondering what – I've had people tell me, like, why are you putting my car up in the air for? It's like, I wanted my fluids checked, and, you know, it just – they, they're trying to figure out what's going on. And we're telling them to do a safety inspection. Well, I don't want that. Just check my fluids. I don't want to go. You know, it's just, it's how, just be well, specific how much you want. If you just want the fluids checked and nothing else, and then that's it. Fluid and air pressure, that's it. Well, you know, I'm in the middle. Of, we're doing that. I'm doing a program now. And uh, real quick here, Dave said the least expensive item – that is mostly overlooked is the wiper blades, and that's a safety issue. Amen to that. Yeah. Yes, they yeah. are. And cleaning yeah. them, yeah. nobody cleans them. I don't understand that. No, they wait till the rubber's swapping off the blade before they come in, and it's almost scratching the windshield. That's what I I've been seeing lately. Yeah, paper towel and a lemon-based cleaner like 409 or fantastic with lemon. You spray it on the paper towel. And you clean the rubber part of the blade. You get all that dirt off. That's going to help prolong the life of the blade. You see these commercials, oh, they'll last forever and do this and do that and make Julian fries, you know. Right. <laughs> it's right. not going to be part of the safety inspection. It, they should well, be looking at the blades too. But people can clean them at home. Like, like I said, with the paper towel and some cleaner. Spray it on there. You wouldn't believe the dirt that comes off. Another thing, too, and we had that experience down here, what was about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago when we had frost on our windshields. People will sit there and they'll use their wiper blades instead of the defroster. And the frost, the ice on the windshield and the wiper blades is acting like little razor blades. You're killing it. You're killing the blades. So get an ice scraper. I mean, we live a little farther north. That maybe some of us should have ice scrapers here. If we live a little farther inland, but um, or use your defroster. Got to remember, one year we were in South Florida in 2010, and I was in, in March, and oh, I was I was threatening that I was going to move to Key West. <laughs> and in the morning, I was out there with my credit card scraping the ice off the windshield. So my wiper blades wouldn't get damaged. That's just me. Well, one of the things for safety and then we'll move on also is when they check everything, come check the light bulbs too. Yes. Yeah, you'll see a lot, a lot of that nowadays. Even on newer cars, you'll see tail light bulbs out on newer cars. You know, either uh, when you're backing up, you can see it in the glass. Or have somebody just check not stand behind you while you're backing up. But while you have your brake lights on, you know, just have somebody, one of your family members, take a glance or a neighbor. Same thing with your headlights. It's really easy to tell against the garage door or inside the garage if your headlights are operational or not. Yeah, if you're yeah. Car, your car broke somewhere with no overhead lights anywhere along the road and people have burned out lights, it's hard to see. It's very hard to see. Oh, get your light bulbs checked too. And another quick tidbit too is that uh, I knew someone that actually, Peter, I called you to uh, help me bring a bulb over. They had a quick flashing turn signal uh, indicator on their dashboard. They'd hit the left turn and it flashed really quick, quick cadence. And they made an appointment to the dealership to go in and fix it. I says, it's a bulb. And they go, oh, no, they said it was this, this, and this. And I called you up, and you brought me over a bulb, and replaced it, and guess what? Done. Bulb. So if you see that quick cadence when you uh, activate your turn signal, and guys, that's, that's what that little lever is on the, on the left-hand side. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> this is supposed to use. It's a state law that you're supposed to use it. <laughs> but seriously, though, when you activate that, you have that quick cadence on one or the left or the right side. It's bulb. You just got to find the bulb. Easy to fix. Real easy to fix. Um, yep. part, part two of that, I've seen people where they'd the hazard, they'd use their hazard, and they didn't quite have it deactivated, and it killed all the park in the turn. And so when you'd hit the turn signal lever, you would get quick cadence on both sides. So check and make sure that, you know, ladies, you didn't bump your purse against the dash while you're throwing it in the passenger seat. And yeah. Kind of hit it a little bit. It was a quick check. Yeah, that turns so good. There's Keep it on the fluid levels between oil changes. That will definitely help. Okay, that's what I was going to tell you. That's what I forgot I was going to tell you. That we're training this new group of techs. Okay. They're almost done. They're getting it. And we were talking about head gaskets last week pros and cons, so on and so forth. And we were talking about this one photo and I showed you, Peter, of somebody who had special ordered a head gasket for an antique car and they put it in a box and it wouldn't fit quite in the box. They bent the head gasket, make it fit in the box. <laughs> That's right, Dave. They took the head gasket, they bent it to put it in the box to mail it to the guy. At a 90 degree <laughs> angle. It's at a 90 degree angle. Well, anyway. the head will straighten it out when you put it back on. Yeah. And for those of you who don't know, those things are supposed to be flat, remain flat <laughs> until you install them. But um, somebody was uh, sitting there, parked there, idling there, talking on the phone in the parking lot. And uh, make a long story short, I got a whiff of combustion. And I, I just kind of stopped. And I said to one of the guys, I said, now I says, we're going to go back to the vehicle we just came over. And I said, and we're going to, I'm going to point out to the tire, but what I really want you to pay attention to, I says, is the odor coming off of the car next to the one we parked. And I want you to just grasp that smell. I says, it's, it's very unique. I says, and it's a sign of combustion and, and in the antifreeze. It says the thing blew head gasket. Pretty obvious. It says, but you don't see the white smoke out the tailpipe yet. It's not that bad yet. So he walked over and he was like, yeah. He says, it's kind of sweet. And I'm like, yes. This says, that is a head gasket smell. It just has this unique odor about it. So he said something. I hope, <laughs> I hope they listen to us. We'll, we'll see, but, um, you know, we got a whole group of techs coming up. <coughs> Excuse me. There's a shortage of technicians. Uh, right now, it used to be around 15,000 short. Oh, last year, year before. Now they're projecting 46,000 technicians short, guys. 46,000 techs short by... 2025. Dave just wrote that that head gasket smell. Yes, maple syrup. Yeah, I guess it does smell like maple syrup, doesn't it, Peter? Yeah. 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 yeah, it does. I'll have to say something tomorrow about that. But we have to train these new techs, and that means 46,000 short because we're aging out. Right now, you can see my hair is a mess because I'm going to be honest with you, I completely forgot about tonight because I was in the middle of something else, doing some other training. And when I write, sometimes I'll just pull on my hair. So <laughs> this is what you get. This is me in my writing phase with my glasses. But the reason why I'm saying this is that you think that you have to wait now for car repair? We're 46,000 short in four years, guys. People don't want to become techs. That means our cars and trucks are going to be sitting there waiting for repair 
longer, longer, longer. You're going to age out just sitting there waiting for your vehicle. I'm joking, waiting for your vehicle. But that's why it's so important to have this communication with your service advisor, with your technician, what's going on. And even more important that when you start hearing an unusual noise or an unusual symptom, that you have it addressed immediately. It's going to be cheaper. You're going to get it back quicker. Yeah, it's yes. Going to, it's going to take care of before a major catastrophe happens and kills your wallet. But you're yeah, more it will. it will. And we've seen it time and time again. And now it's going to hurt even worse. Uh, vehicles are becoming more and more advanced. And we have the tech shortage going on. It's the perfect storm coming for our yep. transportation, for our, our personal transportation. That's right. So, yes, somebody uh, wrote in here and this says 46 auto tech shortage is significant, which it is. It says, be nice to the ones that we have now. Yes, please. Be nice to the techs that you have now. It's important. It really is. Peter, you have anything else that you'd like to add before we... Uh, no, I just we miss Dave. Dave is going to be back next uh, next month, hopefully. Yeah, Dave. Yeah. Hope so too. Yeah. Be, yeah. Just be up front with the service people up front when your car comes in the shop. Just yes. tell them every little minor detail. But just more information is better than less. That way, it saves you money in the long run. It does. It truly does yeah. save you money. Yeah. And we'll, we'll take the opportunity to sort of jump on that discussion about the shortage of techs, right? We do the trainings at AMROC and you do them all over the place, um, yes. you know, and, and people are looking for jobs and they're looking for work. And, and this is a really valuable service, especially as you said, we go into the, um, you know, the, the, as we get into the autonomous vehicles, we need people who know how to work on these things from the ground up and have the foundations of, you know, basic automobile automobile tech uh, repair and stuff like that. Um, you know, I, I'd love to be able to find a way to, to help people understand what a great job it is. I mean, you've been doing, you guys have been doing it forever. Um, you know, I, I don't know how to get that across to people sometimes, even though everybody wants a good auto tech, right? So, I'd still uh, be doing it. Had I, I, I aged out. I mean, I'm a lot older than I look. I aged out. And pick up a transmission before, yeah, not a problem. Nowadays, it's like, nope, come here, help me. <laughs> Just aged yeah, out yeah. from it. And then I really get, it, get them while they're young. Get them while they're, yeah, and they'll be able to write their own ticket because yeah. you're in demand, supply and demand. You're in huge demand. There's a reason yeah. why there's so many shops out there, right? I mean, they're small shops. There's a lot of them. You look all over and you think, oh, there's no shortage. But they're small. They can only handle so many vehicles. And, you know, they don't always have the skills, especially if they're not certified. Uh, the they don't always equipment. have the skills. Yeah, the, and the equipment. Oh, my God. The equipment is outrageous. Um, just for a shop to be ATIS equipped alone, it's over $30,000. Just to do one thing on a vehicle. Wow. Recalibrate ATIS. Just one thing. The equipment's oh, yeah. getting ridiculous. So you're going to see more and more specialty shops and going over to the dealership more because they're the ones who can foot the bill for all the tools, the specialty tools that we'll be needing for our future repairs. Not not quite yet, but I mean, it's, it's heading that way. Well, but, we've got a class starting up in March um, at AMROC. And uh, that's, uh, I guess, um, throughout March, the CG1. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we just did the MVAC. Right. Yep. And we'd like to fill those classes up. I mean, we're doing them online right this time. They're going to be online. Mm -hmm. So we'll be putting out word about that. But, um, you know, if you know anybody who's looking for good work, this is a good thing to steer them towards. So uh, we'll be pushing out more information about that. We're really excited about it. And we do it in Uptown, but you also teach in other areas. Right. I'm all across the U.S. from Alaska down to the Caribbean and everything else in between. Yes. Yeah. Well, if, this, if, this, 
manufacturers yes if the video wanders in anybody else's hands then you know wherever you are you can you can get you can get these classes and, and they're good to have and you know i know i need a good auto tech i think we all do and i want to know that the people who are taking care of my car are doing a good job um one of the things that, that had come up in there earlier i don't know if you saw it was what are some basic things and i think it's probably a good thing to end on um what are some just basic things people can do to make it easier for, to make so not not have to go into the shop as much um but you know so um you know they're they're in as reasonable shape as possible when they do go into a shop right so what are some things that they can do to rule out the basics right that they can take care of at home do your your factory the factory not the dealership not an aftermarket version but the factory maintenance schedule stick with your factory maintenance schedule um and where do people find out if they've got an old car they just bought right or something oh, like that those, there's there's still factory maintenance schedules for them. They just okay. repeat. Yeah. So definitely, you no, know, you got to stick with the factory. Uh, go online and get your factory maintenance from the manufacturer. If the dealership, they should have it, but they have their own as well, where they add on some stuff. Yeah. Um, they add on stuff, guys. Yes, they do. Okay. But you want to stay with the factory maintenance schedule. And remember, there's a severe normal duty service. Do the severe duty service because all of us drive and stop and go traffic. We're not in mountainous terrain here, but if this reaches out to somebody who is in mountainous terrain, mountainous terrain, there's another one. Uh, dirt roads, there's another factor for severe duty. Pulling a trailer or a boat, there's severe duty right there. There's other criteria, but go off the severe duty and you won't go wrong. That'd be the best plan for you. Stuck it in chat there for people. There. <laughs> All right. So, Dave, um, can you think of anything else? I know he's not here. Well, he's here live with us, but he's he's watching. He's watching. <laughs> yeah, he's watching. Well, we're going to keep working on these things. And, you know, as the University Mall area changes, you know, we're going to be putting in more trainings and there's a lot of exciting stuff happening over there. Um, you know, they definitely want automotive, uh, you know, research and development and training to go on there, which I think is wonderful. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunities there for, for people to get, you know, some good new skills for the future. So um, I always love doing these. I always learn something. Um, I always, I always go out and apologize to my car after these conversations. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I do. It's just so bad. You know, and I run into the thing a lot of people run into, right? I work really long hours. Um, and then when I should take it to the shop or something, I'm just tired, right? It's like, oh, I just don't want to do it. But if I took care of it to begin with, I wouldn't have to worry about some of the things that I know are happening to it now. So I'm a good cautionary tale. Don't be like me. <laughs> there, Dave shared a little thing too here. Yeah, basic clues and walk around. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. And if you see a blue and orange or red or a yellow cable when you pop the hood, put the hood back down. Do not touch, please. High voltage. Good thing. Good Just thing. please. Yes. <laughs> Lunch is safe. And I'm not joking when I'm, I'm saying high voltage. I'm I'm talking 140 volts for a compressor, for an example. 300 volts. I mean, just just don't do it. We'll touch things. That's what he does on the That's right. All right. right. Well, I'm going to. I want to call it a night here. I think we're good. Thank you so much. We'll throw some more Thank uh, resources. You. We're gonna. I, I think you. it'd be really nice to add a nice. I, I've um, on the uh, Amrock website. We have a resource page. I haven't put a lot in there on auto care. We probably should. So maybe we can develop. Oh, we can a, do that. Auto, yeah, I think that'd be a lot of fun yeah. to do. Uh, take some stuff off your site and stuff. So uh, people can go to your website for more information too. It's usautotraining.com. Did I get uh -huh. it? Yes, I got it. All right. Yes. Um, and we also link to, to them from amrocktampabay.com. So uh, thank you for watching and thank you to those who are going to watch later. So I really enjoyed this. As always, it's fun and wonderful. We'll see you, thank you on the next third Wednesday. We'll see you then. And I'll be more prepared. I'll be more professional. Sorry. I just, <laughs> no, it's, it's always just fun. one of those we're days good. where I'm like, ah, so but thank you. All right. Bye, guys. Bye, all.